Well, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, verse number 23. Fittingly here in this letter, as with others, we will begin and end with grace. Philippians chapter 4, verse 23, at Balfour, we affirm the truth of 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Philippians chapter 4, verse 23, Paul has reached the end of his letter to the Philippians. Warm greetings have been extended to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, by Paul, by the brethren who are with Paul, by all the saints, especially those who are of Caesar's household. And so Paul ends this letter the same way that he ends each of his letters, with a blessing of grace, a prayer of grace for all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Let's look to your Bible, verse number 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let's pray together. Kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for your grace. Father, we just we pray and ask you, Lord, that make your grace be the desire of our hearts. Lord, just let us to just de- desire your grace, to seek your grace, Lord, to be dependent upon your grace, Lord, each and every day. Lord, let us help, help us to know that your grace is sufficient. Lord, I pray that as we open up the text this morning, Lord, that, uh, that we would look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, I pray that, that you would move me out of the way. Lord, I pray that, that Jesus would increase in the mind of your saints here at Balfour. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here, Lord, that has never received your saving grace, Lord, I pray that today would be the day they would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Lord, I pray you draw them to yourself. Lord, strengthen us and equip us by your wonderful grace. In Jesus' name, amen. One commentator wrote of the book of Philippians, He said, everything is in, of, by, and for Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is the basis for the Philippians' common existence. Now, as we think back, as we have reached the end of this letter, think back to some of the instructions that we've had through this letter. We're instructed in Philippians to rejoice in what? Not in ourselves, but instead the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. We're instructed in Philippians where our confidence should lie. Not in ourselves, but again, the Bible says in Philippians 3.8, Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. We have been instructed in this letter to the Philippians not to be filled with the things of this world, but instead, the Bible says in Philippians 1.11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. We have been instructed in Philippians not to set our mind on earthly things, The reason for that, the Bible says, is in Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. This morning, as we dig into grace, we will explore the reality that the enabling power for the believer to fulfill each one of the commands that we find in this letter, that we find throughout the Bible, is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look to the Bible, verse number 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Think back for a moment to the book of Genesis. 
and what, what you know of Jacob. Think back about Jacob and the times of him, in his life when he was deceiving others, when he himself was being deceived. Think about the loss that Jacob experienced throughout his life. Think about the hardships as he traveled with his family. Think about the famine that they faced. Unbeknownst to them, God had already placed Joseph in Egypt, working ahead of them. When Jacob and his family arrive there in Egypt, Joseph introduces them to Pharaoh. The Bible says in Genesis 47, 9, And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers and the days of their pilgrimage. You know, as we look around this sanctuary, from the youngest to the not quite so youngest anymore, whether we're here and we're just beginning the race, or you're here and you realize that that finish line is appearing on the horizon, each one of us is in need of grace. This morning as we start, we're going to look at grace from its most basic level. And then we'll progress and ultimately end with an understanding of Paul's prayer here for the Philippians. But look to your Bible, verse number 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let's begin by defining this word grace. It comes from a root word that's been used throughout this letter to the Philippians. That root word is translated most often as rejoice. The word translated grace here simply means undeserved favor. Now when we speak of grace, we often speak of mercy and grace together. It's helpful to do that because it gives us a a clear understanding. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we do not deserve. At the most basic level, we have common grace. That is the grace that God extends to His creation. That is the grace that each person created in the image and likeness of God, living in the world that He created, Each person is a recipient of common grace. It's how we can see a scientist who's a non-believer develop a cure for a disease. God has given common grace. Common grace is not dependent upon one's relationship with God. Common grace is extended to those living in a right relationship to God. Common grace is extended to those living in rebellion. To God. Jesus gives the clearest illustration of common grace to his disciples. He was teaching them of the importance of loving their enemies. He said, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. The sun rising in the morning is common grace toward both the evil and the good. The rain falls upon the back on the just and the unjust. This is all grounded in the covenant with God made with Noah following the flood. God said in Genesis 8, 22, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Moving from common grace, let's consider saving grace. Saving grace is the grace that those those who have previously lived in rebellion against God, they receive through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep your place here in Philippians 
But turn back to Romans chapter 3, verse number 9. Romans chapter 3, verse number 9. Paul has laid out the sinfulness of the Gentiles. He's laid out the sinfulness of the Jews. He's laid out the dire nature of the human condition. Setting it before how each one lives and and what they have coming. If you found your place, please say amen. The Bible says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. You see, as we read that text, there's no escape clause. It's addressing each and every one of us. And if you say, well, that's, that, that can't be me, look at, at what is said there in the, at, toward the end of that passage, that every mouth may be stopped. You won't stand before God and offer an excuse. Each one of us falls into this category. The Bible goes on to say that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Each one of us stands in need of saving grace. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember those terms, mercy and grace. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we do not deserve. Each one of us, because of our sin, has earned and deserves death. However, the Christian has received the gift of God's mercy, not getting what he or she has earned and deserved, which is death. If you go back to Romans 6, verse 23, we see the Christian has received the gift of God's grace, getting what he or she did not earn or deserve, eternal life. Eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Set your minds for a moment on the Lord Jesus Christ. The one John identifies as the Word. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Set your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who made it clear that he is the only means of reconciliation between sinful man and holy God. The Bible says in John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Set your mind on the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who Paul pointed the Corinthians to. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 20 through 21, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Set your mind on the Lord Jesus Christ, the one Paul has pointed us to throughout this letter. 
The Bible says in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Please turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1. Here we have a clear picture of where each one of us was before God saved us by His grace. Here we have a clear picture of the before and after in the life of a believer, showing us how God secured our salvation. If you found your place, please say amen. The Bible says, And you He made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Before we go any further this morning, I want to ask you the question, have you been saved by grace through faith? If you have not, This letter to the Philippians has probably frustrated you because you've not been able, you've not been equipped to live out what's been asked of you. It's written to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. It's written to believers. Have you been saved by grace through faith? If not, I appeal to you, repent and believe the gospel. Turn from your sin and believe the good news of 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9 through 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Returning back to Philippians chapter 4, we already know this letter is written by Paul. He's a bondservant of Jesus Christ. It's written by Paul under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. It's written to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Lydia is there. She's hearing this letter read. Do you remember Lydia, the one who the Bible says in Acts chapter 16, now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. The Philippian jailer is there, listening to this letter being read. The jailer, 
the one who after the earthquake asked the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The Bible says in Acts chapter 16, So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. This letter is written to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. A letter written by a Christian under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, written to other Christians. A letter written from one partaker of grace to fellow partakers of grace. And this letter begins with grace. The Bible says in Philippians 1, 2, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This letter ends with grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. If you're back to Philippians 4, verse number 23, let's take our final dive into this word grace. If you remember, it is defined as undeserved favor. Paul is praying for the church there in Philippi that the undeserved favor of our Lord Jesus Christ would be upon them. Now, this letter was written to all the saints who are in Christ Jesus. This letter was written to Christians, having been saved by grace through faith. You might ask, well, why was this sustaining grace even necessary in their lives? A few years later, Paul would write a letter to Timothy. Timothy was facing the challenges of trying to lead the churches there in Ephesus. Paul wrote to him, You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. You see, the challenges that Timothy was facing, they were too great. He was unable to manage them by his own strength. He needed the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The challenges facing the Philippians were too great. They could not manage them on their own. They needed the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The challenges that you and I face are too great. We cannot face them on our own. We need the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do not miss the source of grace. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who Paul has pointed to throughout this entire letter. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one who humbled himself and was exalted. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one Paul points to in 2 Corinthians. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Don't miss the source of grace. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who Paul wanted more, he wanted to know him more and more. 
The Bible says in Philippians 3.10 that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one Paul drew strength from. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul came to realize that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ was sufficient for him. That the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ was made perfect in weakness. What well do you draw from for your strength? Paul drew from the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. His grace is sufficient. Please turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1, verse number 9. Let's consider in our closing time here, how Paul instructed all the saints in Christ Jesus who were in Philippi to live. Let's consider how Paul, and through the the Holy Spirit, is instructing us today in how all the saints in Christ Jesus at Balfour are to live. If you found your place, please say amen. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense on the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Christ Jesus, to the glory and praise of God. As Christians, how can we do this? By the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. Move down a few verses to verse number 19. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now, also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. How is it possible to have that mindset? By the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Move down a little further to verse number 27. Consider the persecution the church was facing. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. How can a church stand together when facing intense persecution? By the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look down to chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, 
but also for the interests of others. This mindset, this attitude that's being demanded of a believer, this, is, this goes against every human inclination. How can we live these commands out? By the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Skip down to Philippians 2, verses 12 through 16. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. How is it possible for a Christian to live in such a way as we're called to do here in the Scriptures by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Continue into chapter 3 and look at verse 12. Not that I have already obtained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. How is it possible to continue to press toward that goal, facing obstacle after obstacle, after obstacle. It's possible by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, let's close out by looking at chapter 4, verse number 1. Therefore, my beloved, and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore Yodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, Help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there's any praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Think for a moment, how is it possible to stand fast? How is it possible to be of the same mind? How is it possible to rejoice always? How is it possible to let your gentleness be known to all men? How is it possible to be anxious for nothing? By our own strength, it is impossible. It is only possible by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul closes his letter with amen. A resounding, let it be so. A word from him to the Philippians, let us stand on the principles and the promises of this letter. Let us stand on the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, perhaps you're here this morning, and you are a Christian. You have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have been saved. But up until this point, you have attempted to live out the Christian life by your own strength. 
you've attempted to do and accomplish anything and everything you can, absent the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to ask you a question this morning. How is that working out for you? Because you're not designed to live the Christian life absent the sustaining grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not designed that way. The Lord Jesus Christ, He is the source of sustaining grace. Sustaining grace is received by a posture of humility. So if you're here this morning and you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been redeemed from sin and death, yet you are trying to live out the Christian life in your own strength. My simple admonition to you this morning is to repent of your pride and humbly receive God's grace. If you're trying to live out the Christian life in your own strength, repent of your pride and humbly receive God's grace. The Bible says in James 4, 6 and in 1 Peter 5, 5, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Think about that for just a moment. If you are actively trying to live out the Christian life apart from God, apart from the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are doing so pridefully. And the Bible tells us that God resists the proud. It doesn't mean that He doesn't just help the proud along. It means He actively resists the proud. So we must repent of our pride and humbly receive God's grace. Because the Bible says, God gives grace to the humble. I'll close this morning with a simple prayer. It's a prayer that each one of us can and should be praying for one another. If you look around this sanctuary this morning, there is not one of your brothers and sisters here in Christ who are not in need of grace. And so the simple prayer is the ending of this letter. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.